So I want to talk to you about <clears throat> this is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. I had requests for a discussion pertaining to the doctrine of the resurrection and in orthodox theology really it's just synonymous with theosis. Now theosis is the doctrine of the deification of man and that may sound strange to a lot of people especially in the West because they probably think that means something new agey or apotheosis or something out of the occult but actually it's not it's really the biblical tradition itself and so if you look back to Genesis in the garden man was put into a very blessed state but we would say that it was also temporary in a kind of probationary state so when man fell Adam was functioning as what we could biblically call a covenantal head in that he stood for all of his representatives, all of his progeny to come. And a covenant is really just the idea of how God relates to man in the scriptures. So when Adam broke the divine law, uh, what he did was he separated himself from communion with God. And what this did was it introduced corruption, uh, passability, and so forth, death into his lineage and into his descendants. And because man was put into dominion over creation, that death and corruption then extended to affecting all of the universe. So essentially all the universe uh, partakes of this negative state of being or this entropy we might say or this, this uh, what Paul calls corruption in Romans 8. And so the whole creation uh, stood in that relationship to Adam and then Adam brought that state of moving away from the good and towards negation, towards death, towards non-being and so forth. This is the way that the church fathers speak about what it means to have death as a privation and corruptibility as privation and so forth. Now, when we get to the redemptive history that's described throughout the Old Covenant, what you have is a series of covenants, right? You have a covenant with Noah, and then you have a covenant with Abraham, right, throughout the book of Genesis. And what these covenants do is build on the previous covenant, and they reveal more of who God is. Uh, God is revealed, for example, to be personal. He's revealed to be omniscient, omnipotent. All the things that the pagan gods were not. They were, you know, basically uh, arrogant hum humanizations uh, of natural forces all fighting with one another, right? This sort of personalization of the forces of nature. But the biblical God is different in that he is personal, but he also includes these apophatic categories such as infinity, uh, such as omniscience, such as omnipresence, omnibenevolence, and so forth, right? And this revelation was done through a body of people over time, right? That in, if you go back to Genesis, it's the family and the descendants of Seth, right? So Adam and Eve have Seth, and they also have Cain, and the wicked descend from Cain. The descendants of Seth are those who maintain the tradition of who this God is. So there's a, a real sense to which we hold the reality of, or the historicity of the Bible to be accurate, and that's necessary if you want to believe this religion. I mean, if the historicity is not accurate, if it's all false or made up or something like that, then, then the, really the New Testament revelation is also false because the New Testament writers, and including Jesus in the Gospels, consistently uh, interprets Genesis in these different books as historical. So really that's part of our dogma, it's part of our revelation. And these covenants then, as I said, uh, build on one another and they have within them the typology or the future signif signification of a coming redeemer or a coming fulfillment of each one of the meanings of these covenants. So in, in, uh, with Noah, Noah, for example, becomes a type of Christ. And so this is why Peter will say in his epistle that baptism is like the ark, right? It puts us into the ark, which is the church, right? Uh, and, and, and that baptism harkens back to the flood of Noah. That was a, a type, a symbol of something that was to come, fulfilled, uh, spiritually speaking, in the reality of the church. In the same way, Adam uh, was a type of the church, uh, in, or excuse me, Eve was a type of the church. Adam was a type of Christ, right? The bride that comes out of the side uh, of, of Adam. And in the same way that Adam represented all of his descendants, so Jesus, or the Logos, represents before the Father all of his descendants, right? All of his progeny, which ultimately involves the restoration, the transfiguration of the entire cosmos, not just uh, human nature. 
So what happened then is that to understand resurrection is that in each one of these covenants, and that includes, by the way, the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant, by the time that we get to the new covenant in Christ, this is the fulfillment. This is the end of, uh, as Luke calls it, the days of vengeance, right? Where all of the prophecies have been fulfilled uh, insofar as the Messiah has come. And the Messiah is a divine person. It's the second person of the Godhead, we say. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of course, making up who it is that is God, three persons. Uh, and these persons find their identity or, or who they are in their relationship to the source of the Godhead, the Father. Right. So the Father is the Arche, he's the autogenitos, he's the self-cause of, of the deity, and he's also the cause of all creation. So all creation bears that uh, contingent relationship to the Father, and then the, the, the Son and the Spirit bear their uh, relationship of origin to the Father. So the Father generates the Son, and that is the property that is specific to the Son. And the Father spirates the Spirit, and that spiration is an eternal manifestation that is only in and through the Son. So the Father <clears throat> does not share any of those uh, hypostatic properties uh, with he does not share his hypostatic property with the Son or the Spirit. Likewise, the Son being generated from the Father does not share generation with another person in the Godhead. The Spirit does not share his spiration uh, with the Son or the Father. And so that's how the Orthodox view keeps the Trinity in balance. Now, why do I say all that? Well, because creation, when it fell, it disrupted that relationship between God and creation. And God knew this, obviously being all-knowing, but he created a world in which allow for the possibility of freedom, free will. Now, that means then that in Christ, to be united back into communion with God, into the new covenant, which is the summation and the fulfillment of all the previous covenants, right? It fulfills them. It doesn't, like, throw them away or toss them out or anything like that. And in fact, all of the meanings and, sim and symbolic significances that are in, for example, the Law of Moses, those are all fulfilled and still kept, still understood, still uh, they still hold uh, fast in their spiritual fulfillment and significance in the New Covenant. And this is what Hebrews says when it talks about typology. This is what Galatians says when it talks about typology, particularly Galatians 4 and the way Paul describes the allegory of Hagar and Sarah. Now, that shows, by the way, as I've written in my typology essay, that Hagar and Sarah were historical realities, right? You can't just allegorize them away as heretics like Origen did. But we're talking about resurrection, so what does this mean? Well, in Christ, in the restoration of fallen humanity, we have the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. And this is really the telos of all history. Ephesians 2 says that the world was created for the church. Uh, and that means that resurrection plays a central role in redemption. And ultimately, if you read the New Testament, you really get the impression, I would say, having read it for 20 years now or more, that the doctrine of the resurrection is the gospel, right? If we were to sum up the gospel, you know, Paul says things like Christ crucified, right? And that's not, he's not ex uh, excluding the doctrine of the resurrection or his descent into Hades, for example. Uh, he's just including it all, right? Death, burial, and resurrection under the title of Christ crucified. So in the crucifixion, what happens is that God the Father sends the Son, because the Son is divine, he's a divine person, he has the ability and the power to destroy the power of death. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that right, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that is accomplished definitively in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So what a lot of Protestants, for example, misunderstand, and I would say a lot of Roman Catholics too have never really thought about this, but this is the pretty much consistent Eastern teaching is the, the idea of recapitulation. So if you go and read St. Irenaeus against the heresies, he'll talk about the doctrine of recapitulation, that Christ recapitulates everything that Adam brought death and destruction upon. And that means then that, that the resurrection of all men is based on the resurrection of Christ. There's no other reason why human nature, universally speaking, is raised other than because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So when Christ took on humanity, he lived all of the stages of humanity, right? He was a child, he was young, uh, he you know, became a fully grown man, and then he experienced death and resurrection, right? So he's been through all the possible stages of humanity, and that's how he's able to redeem 
a person at any stage in humanity. That's why we would say infants should be baptized. Uh, because, number one, it's what the church has always done. But number two, it's also the teaching of the New Testament. Because the covenant is not exclusive or based on something like rational, you know, ratiocination or something like that. That's not what it is that makes you part of the covenant. Uh, being included in the covenant is really uh, a matter of who you stand in relationship to covenantally. So if your family uh, is part of the church and you're born into that family and you're baptized, you're part of that covenant. And this is the principle that we see all throughout the Old Testament, right? The household of Noah, right, is brought into the covenantal relationship on the basis of, of Noah's faith, right? Now, that doesn't mean that a person isn't required to fulfill their aspect of the covenant as they get older, right? This is what we see taught in Deuteronomy, right? And into the New Testament as well. We have an obligation uh, to fulfill the obligate to fulfill our side of the covenant. Uh, and that does not mean that it's a faith versus works thing. But strictly speaking, the resurrection then is the doctrine of our actual bodies that we have, that we were given, being raised up for all of eternity. And obviously, you know, to be put into a better state of being to where it's not subject to corruption. And we know this because this is what happens after Jesus is resurrected. You know, he, taught, he, he walks around at the end of the Gospel of John, and he's talking to the uh, disciples, uh, and he has the same body that he had beforehand. And that's why Thomas puts his finger in the side, because he notices the same wound. So the resurrection of Christ becomes the archetype or the pattern for everyone else's resurrection. And how we live in this life will then determine how we experience the afterlife or the next life, right? Which is not a Gnostic thing where the, where the spirit departs from the body or something like that. That we would say is heresy. In fact, it is this world that is going to be renovated, restored, and transfigured, as well as our bodies, but that only happens contingent upon, or in other words, the experience of that as blessedness only happens contingent upon whether or not we are truly united to Christ. And that happens through faith, and then through faith it brings about the works that we uh, engage in to God's glory, obviously, which are done by grace, but that is theosis. Theosis is participating in the divine nature and that's why Peter says this in second Peter he says that we become partakers in the divine power the divine nature and how do we do that we do that by theosis right this is the doctrine of theosis and theosis is resurrection so we participate already now in that glorification Paul says in his epistles and that glorification then results in the final state of resurrection uh, and transfiguration so what you see, for example, in Jesus on Mount Tabor, uh, when he's transfigured, that is the divine energy uh, radiating forth from him, right? Because he is the, the Son of God. And so when he took fallen human nature upon himself, he deified it. This is the teaching of the Eastern Fathers, uh, Gregor of Nazianzus, Gregor of Nyssa. It's also the teaching of the, of the councils in terms of uh, the way Ephesus talks about the the Eucharist, what the Eucharist is, is very similar to the Incarnation, right? It's the deification of created matter, of creation, a body thou hast prepared for me, David says, as he prophesies the Incarnation of the Messiah. So all of this is, in summation, what the doctrine of the Resurrection is, and it really should be understood in terms of Orthodox theosis. And theosis means being like God, it means participating in the life of God. If you want a, a, an even clearer statement of this, look at John 17, where Jesus says that he came to give to his followers, to his disciples, the very life that he has with the Father. And that life is immortality. It's eternality, right? So that's what the doctrine of the resurrection is. Now we're going to get into some more of this and how this was taught in Genesis, right? We go back to the end of Genesis when Joseph is buried in a coffin, Right? And now he's in Egypt, but that, that's how the Egyptians got this doctrine of resurrection, right? That was unique in the ancient world, right? The Greeks did not follow the Egyptians in this idea of bodily resurrection. Where did the Egyptians get it? Well, they got it from what Genesis 50 says. It's where, uh, you know, here's uh, the death of Joseph, the, the very last chapter. And he's being buried because he is anticipating the bodily resurrection. Jesus says, I, uh, God is not the God of the living, or excuse me, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, right? When he's debating with the Pharisees in the book of John, and he's talking about how Abraham is not dead, Abraham is alive, he's alive to God, right? Abraham's bosom, 
And so what happened was is that in the process of Christ's ministry and then his death, burial, and resurrection, the Old Testament saints, we might say the fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were in a place in Hades that was somewhat blessed, but still not the heavenly state, right? The third heavens that Paul talks about. Why was that? Well, because human nature was fallen and it had not been restored yet because the Messiah had not come and conquered death in the death, burial, and resurrection. So when Christ descended, and this is an important doctrine that's overlooked, especially in the West, is Christ's descent into hell or, quote, Hades. This is just the abode of the dead. And he went there and preached the gospel. So presumably uh, the pagans and others who had never heard of this coming Messiah would have then been exposed to him. And, you know, we don't know all the ins and outs of what went down, but we do know, and it is uh, orthodox doctrine, the harrowing of hell, that Christ took all of these patriarchs and he then led this ascension into the third heavens or the throne of God, right? The heaven of heavens. Now, Hebrews says that the Old Testament, when the high priest would go into, in from the portico to the holy place, into the holy of holies, that this was symbolic of Christ's ascension into heaven, right? And so in the old covenant, when the, the high priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood of the covenant on the day of atonement on top of the ark, this was foreshadowing what would happen or what would need to happen for Christ to cleanse the way uh, for humanity in these bodies that we have to be resurrected and then in, and dwell and inhabit the heavens, right? And then at the end of time, we'll see that full universal bodily resurrection, right? And then the whole universe will be renovated and will become the abode of God, right? This was the symbolism of the Old Testament temple. It symbolized the entire universe in the first, second, and third heavens. Okay, That's why there's three levels to the temple. This is what the book of Hebrews teaches, if you read it. So all of that is, we would say, fulfilled now. right? And so this is the period in which the nations are being taught, as was prophesied all throughout the Old Covenant, throughout the Psalms, throughout Isaiah, the, the doctrines of the Messiah. Right? The doctrines of God, the law of God is now going out to all the nations. Right, This is what the minor prophets prophesy. And so we are in that period of history. And then history comes to its telos, its fulfillment, whenever God determines right, that it's time for the end of history. So that is, in summation, the doctrine of the resurrection. And it's really just God fulfilling his covenant promises that he made back even to Adam about bringing a redeemer, right? If you remember in Genesis, he says that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's the promise of the Messiah, the Proto-Evangelium. So that in summation is a, a brief explanation of what the resurrection or the doctrine of the resurrection is and how it is the gospel, ultimately. That is the gospel in summation, is that we are preparing for this coming resurrection. We gotta be ready for it, right? This is what the New Testament teaches. Uh, this is the teaching of the church. This is the teaching of the Orthodox Church and the Ecumenical Councils for the last 2,000 years. So that's what we would say is the essence of the gospel. And that is the meaning of theosis. Theosis is it's something that we experience now, but it's anticipatory also for the fullness of the bodily resurrection that Paul talks about. And this is what he describes in Romans 8 as the renovation of the entire cosmos. That's why we would say Christ's the effects of his taking on humanity are then the result of, uh, that, that results in, that causes the complete renovation of the cosmos, right? So that's what we look forward to, uh, and that's why this religion is unique in that it teaches not just the bodily resurrection, uh, obviously Judaism and Islam teach that, but they teach a very different perspective on how that comes about and why it comes about, a different metaphysic, if you will. So this is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. If you like this talk, uh, you can go to Jay's Analysis and get the full talk uh, where I go into this in more depth and why, why and what we believe about the bodily resurrection. Thank you.